guys. Before we get started, I wanted to tell you about a new podcast that I've been loving and listening to week to week. It's called Crime of the Truest Kind, hosted by Angel Wood. The podcast is centered on New England crime stories with regional history and rock and roll added in. Crime of the Truest Kind is one of my favorite podcasts right now. Sometimes I actually will go back and re-listen to old episodes as I wait for the new one to come out. And I find myself learning something new every time. I think part of the reason this podcast is so good is that host Angel Wood has formerly worked as a DJ in radio and she studied broadcast journalism. So not only are you getting a lot of information, but the sound quality of this show is fantastic. Also, because this podcast focuses primarily on true crime cases from the New England area, I'm learning about a lot of news stories that I'd never heard of before. And I think this is great because, of course, we all love a new true crime story, but more importantly, it's getting the stories of these victims out there. And a lot of these retellings include interviews done by Angel with reporters, witnesses, and even family members of victims. I could go on and on talking about this podcast all day, but instead of listening to me, check out this trailer for Crime of the Truest Kind and find episodes of Crime of the Truest Kind wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, guys. Well, hello. My name is Angel Wood, host of Crime of the Truest Kind, a new podcast centered on New England crime stories. Each episode walks you through a local story, the places involved in that story, and unravels the details of what happened. To borrow from some of the show reviews, Crime of the Truest Kind has been called clever, brilliant, compassionate, smart, poignant, well-researched, a great balance of storytelling, humor, and New England facts. And if you like true crime and New England, this is the podcast you've been looking for. Now, as a longtime radio host in Boston, I will warn you, rock and roll does creep in. Crime of the Truest Kind, new episodes every other Wednesday. Follow and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Spotify, Good Pods, Pandora, that's a lot of peas, and everywhere you listen to podcasts. Also available on YouTube, SoundCloud, and crimeofthetruestkind.com. Thanks for listening. All right. So in case you just missed it, I dropped the phone and everything fell apart. So I'm going to try again. That was, um, oh, well. Hello and welcome to our mini episode. We're covering In Cold Blood today. We're just going to talk about our takes on the movie, some fun facts, and it's more of a casual conversation. I've mentioned this before, but these are more us just talking and kind of allowing us to give you something every week because there is no way right now that we can do one episode a week. But speaking of that, I was going to give everybody a little update on how we're going to be going moving forward. So when Grace and I first came up with the concept of doing the podcast, we decided that we would do 10 movies as our quote unquote season one. And then we would reevaluate, see what works, what doesn't work and go from there. So we've got three more movies to get up to that 10 movie mark. And that'll be our season one. We'll be done with that. We're going to take just a little bit of a break only so we can start preparing season two so that we can start getting things out more consistently. And by the way, anytime anything's been late, it has 1000% been my fault. <laughs> so, <laughs> But Bolton does all of our editing, so I praise Bolton. Yeah, it takes a while sometimes. All of our uh, movies for season two so far have been recommendations. We've got a few more slots open. And we would very much love to get started on our season three as well. So we would love if you send us some recommendations. You can do that through our website, send us a message, or you can do it on any of our social medias. We're at Crime Scenes Pod on everything. And then we also want to announce our giveaway winner. We did a merch giveaway where if you gave us a five-star review and you wrote a nice review for us, then we were going to give you some merch. So our winner is, I'm going to say her username. I don't know if she wants me to say her whole name. It is at the underscore Lady Q. So congratulations. And that was actually such a coincidence because she actually tagged us in some pictures of a first edition of In Cold Blood. So it was like a perfect little... It was destined. That is a happy coincidence. So I will send you a message and we'll get all that stuff sorted out so that you can get some merch. Yeah. All right. So let's get into it. I want to know, first of all, let's go do our instant take. Grace, you had never seen this before. Yeah. 
What did you think? Overall, I really liked it at the beginning. I thought it was a little slow just because it was like jumping around and I didn't really know the background. Um, But by the end of it, I was like, that's a really good movie. (laughs) I was all in by the end. Yeah. It does jump around a lot at first. And I even, I still notice things that I've gotten wrong in the past. Like, for example, it jumps around so much that there's a point where we're at the murder scene and we see the boot print, obviously, that was made by Perry Smith's boot. And I said this, I made this mistake and I had to go back and correct it. I thought that the camera moves up and we're seeing that they left the boots there. Like they didn't want to have any association with them. That was wrong. And I didn't realize that till like a more recent watch. I always thought they took the book boots with them. Yeah. I mean, it's stuff like that that just it goes very fast at first and then it kind of slows down once they get arrested. I do wish they had gotten more into the trial. I see why I said this in the podcast. I see why they didn't. Everybody, it was very heavy at that point. You just saw this massive murder. But there was a lot of stuff with their mental health that it didn't get addressed in the movie. It did, but it was not so much about the court case. Right. It was more like philosophical in the movie. Like they showed you about their childhood and stuff they went through and then questioned if it was worth taking more lives for it or not. Right. So here's, I was going to ask you this. I'm not going to put you on the spot about like... (laughs) The death penalty? Yeah, I'm not going to do that to you. (laughs) But here's my question. Do you think that they should have been allowed to bring in more on their insanity defense? So basically, I explained this in the podcast. They were extremely limited in what they could talk about because the doctor didn't have a lot of time to evaluate either one of them. Mm -hmm. He said he wasn't sure if Perry Smith knew right from wrong. He needed more time. He couldn't form an opinion. And with Dick, he did think he knew right from wrong. But he wanted to examine him more to see if he had some brain damage as a result of that car accident. Mm -hmm. And the reason he wanted to see that is it possibly would have had a big effect on his mental health, which no, if he knew right from wrong, he couldn't have been insane, but it could have affected the sentence that people gave him they might have given him life yeah so my question is do you think that it should have been included in there or did the judge do the right thing and not allowing it um i mean when someone's life's on the line i definitely think more evidence is better even if it's going to result in a delay and then given the politics of like they were waiting to make this movie until the case was concluded for them to have been executed so you have to kind of wonder like what political stuff was at play where it was like we didn't want to drag this out any further than needed that's all skepticism at this point (laughs) i have no evidence to support that that's why it happened but yeah i think when someone's life's on the line more evidence is better i get that there's a point where it's like you can't just keep allowing evidence but especially when a doctor's like i don't have enough to give you an opinion like i think we need more yeah I agree. I think they should have let more in. And I think that now they definitely would have been given more time. Yeah. That's all I got. I was going to get into some fun facts. Do you have anything else before I do that? I'm ready for fun facts. I'm ready for this new information discussion. (laughs) Okay. So first I have some short fun facts, then I'll get into the long ones. I've got three long ones. Okay. Just some random stuff. Dick Hickok, after he was executed, actually donated his eyes for corneal transplants. And two patients in Kansas City got those later that day. Wow. And next thing. Okay, you know my favorite scene? The bottle scene where they're picking up all the bottles with those that grandpa and his kids? Yeah. In total, they collected 420 bottles and they got $12.60 for it. Which $12.60 is the equivalent to $100 today. That's crazy. But now with how they have the law, now there's a deposit law. You can see it on bottles where it has $0.05 cents in most places and $0.10 cents in Michigan. Mm-hmm. They would get about $21. Or $42 in Michigan. Michigan's the place to be. Yep. (laughs) That's also a Seinfeld episode (laughs) where Kramer and Newman are trying to sell the bottles. Anyway. (laughs) Then, okay, I wanted to see if you knew this because you might know this. Okay. The year before the murder happened, Truman Capote published a very famous novella. Do you know what it is? I do not. Breakfast at Tiffany's. Oh, that's crazy. Yep. And then I don't remember when that movie was made, what year it was. I don't remember either. I just remember Cats, and I love Cats so much. (laughs) (laughs) That movie, this is a whole whole sidetrack that we could get into. That's our second podcast. (laughs) Oh, God. I was going to say, Audrey Hepburn's kind of (laughs) overrated. Don't yell at me. Don't get mad at me for saying that. I just, I want to say people who see Breakfast at Tiffany's, I'm like, do you understand what that movie is about? Also, 
she's not it, it was not cast right it should have been marilyn monroe mm. anyway <laughs> let's move on this was actually i noticed this if you watch old movies a lot you usually don't see that they're rated like movies are rated now but this movie actually was rated r oh and it was the first movie to use the expletive bullshit in the dialogue. <laughs> so tame compared to our podcast. I know. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I also, There's also a part where I saw, like, Dick at the very beginning. I noticed it this time watching it. He flips someone off when he's driving the car. They're driving by in the car. And I was oh. like, oh, my God. I never noticed that. Yeah. It's nuts when you watch older movies a lot and then you you start getting to more modern ones. You I feel like I'm like clutching my pearls. Like I'm like, "Oh my god, I'm so offended." Yet here I am. <laughs> 500 people tried out to be Dick and Perry. We talked in the main podcast about how Columbia wanted it to be Paul Newman and Steve McQueen, which would have been a disaster. Right. Another person that tried out for the role of Perry Smith was Danny DeVito, which Oh, wow. He's he's such a small little man. Actually, it might have worked, now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, it might have worked. But he did not get it. He did not make his film debut till 1970. And then Scott Wilson ultimately gets the role of Dick. And he got that role after his co-star in a previous movie, Sidney Poitier, recommended him for it. And he didn't even know that he had recommended him until after he was cast in the role. They had been in In the Heat of the Night together. And then my last short fact is you notice in the movie that Perry Smith references the movie The Treasure of the Sierra Madre a bunch. Mm -hmm. And initially people thought that they did that because Robert Blake, he was like a small boy and he sells Humphrey Bogart something in the movie. Like he's in the movie as an extra and they thought it was like an, an homage to him being in that movie. But it actually was a coincidence because that really was Perry Smith's favorite movie. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Alrighty, now I've got long facts. The long facts are, like, dark and nuts. Yeah, I'm ready to talk about this. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give an overview of what they are first. We've got Robert Blake, the actor that played Perry Smith, was years and years later charged with and then later acquitted of murder of his wife. Second big fact is one of their cellmates or one of the other prisoners when they were on death row was a pretty famous guy named Lowly Andrews. And he's got a pretty crazy story. So I was going to tell what happened with that. Okay. And then the last one is the question of whether Dick and Perry possibly committing another murder while they were on the run. Oh. So now that I've given all of them and everyone wants to know, <laughs> let's go back to the first one. Yeah, this is the one that I got a little deep into. Yeah, jump in and interrupt me yeah, if you I need will. to. I listened to I listened to a podcast episode. It was Marsha Clark's. Marsha Clark had a podcast at some point that was in conjunction with an A and E show she did, and she talked about this. Oh, that's cool. She's a little much for my taste, but it was it was interesting. <laughs> so Robert Blake, after he made In Cold Blood, he was in a show that was pretty well known, and he was also known as a child star. He ultimately meets. And marries this woman named Bonnie Lee Bakley in 1999. And I'm saying this because it's true. I'm not. I'm not trying to speak ill of the dead or blame her or anything like that. But Bonnie Lee B Bakley was a. She was like a little bit of a scam artist slash a little bit of a gold digger. And he was her tenth husband. Yes, that's a lot of getting married. That's yeah. <laughs> Do you think at by the 10th one, you're like, maybe this just isn't for, something's going on, or maybe I should go to, I don't know, marriage counseling? I would think. So they meet, they get married, but before they get married, their relationship was very casual. They were not in it for the long haul initially, and she was having, she was having relationships with other people as well, as was he, to be fair. Mm -hmm. But she ends up getting pregnant. And Perry Smith was under the impression she did that on purpose. I don't know if that's true, but there is... You mean Robert Blake. <laughs> Damn it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Robert Blake. Yes, the man who played Perry Smith. Robert Blake was under the impression she did it on purpose. And there is a pretty compelling recorded phone call between them where he kind of calls her out. Like, it's possible she did do it on purpose. But then there was a debate for a long time if it was Robert Blake's child or if it was Christian Brando, Marlon Brando's kid's child. For a while, she actually had the baby and thought that it was Brando's kid. And then it was not until they did a DNA test because this Brando guy insisted that they realized it was actually Perry Smith. So now Perry Smith gets actually brought into the whole mess. So after that happens, he's not on good terms with this lady, but they are married. And on May 4th of 2001, Blake and his wife are out to dinner at this restaurant in Studio City, California. Mm-hmm. 
they go to the restaurant and they've left and they've gotten their car from the valet. As they are driving, I guess, and this is the most ridiculous, you've got to come up with a better lie than this. Robert Blake says, oh, I forgot my gun. I left it in the restaurant booth. Yeah. What? In 2001, apparently, it was cool to just take your gun into this Italian restaurant in Hollywood. <laughs> well, I understand people have concealed carry and stuff. So why? Why? In what position was it in to fall out of your out of your person? Like, I... Yeah. So he's like, oh, honey, I forgot my gun. So he goes around a corner and he actually parks around the corner from the restaurant behind a dumpster. He basically goes into an alley. Mm-hmm. And he goes back into this restaurant. Now, to be fair, it was very crowded and very busy. But as he is gone, he's in the restaurant. His wife is shot and she is killed. Mm -hmm. He comes back and there's also a civilian that sees him. And he's freaking out. The civilian is trying... The civilian, the witness. Why am I saying civilian? (laughs) Is trying to help him. And what they claim is unusual. I don't think this is that unusual. He runs back into the restaurant to get help. Yeah, I don't think that's unusual. Yeah. And they also were saying... Marsha Clark was also saying that he was, like, trying to cry. Like, it was very obvious he was, like, trying to make fake tears. Uh. Which I also don't think... If there's anything we've ever learned, you can't react to how someone's going to be. Plus, he's an actor. I'm pretty sure if he wanted to cry, he's going to cry. Yeah. So then they actually end up finding the gun that was used to shoot her. And it was in the dumpster next to the car. It was not the same gun that Perry Smith was claiming to have left in the restaurant. It was a totally different gun. Right. They do GSR gunshot residue. They test it on Perry Smith or fuck Robert Blake. And there's nothing really on him. But the thing is, is she was shot inside the car. So there was very little room for it to spread onto the person shooting. Got it. The case kind of goes cold until a year later when two stuntmen that were retired that used to work with Perry Smith go to the police and they tell them that Robert Blake. Robert Blake. (laughs) Approached them and he basically asked them to kill his wife. They were trying to hire him to do it, and they refused to. Mm -hmm. So this opens the whole case back up, and it gives them motives. The problem is, though, they don't have a lot of direct evidence. They just have this story about this guy. Yeah, they had, like, no evidence. But they did have a couple things. He said the exact day that they did this, and he had a receipt from the restaurant where they met at, and he offered this to him. And then they also had a calling card. Robert Blake wanted to only communicate with these two guys via a calling card and a payphone. And there were actually calls made on this calling card to Robert Blake via his home phone. And he made the mistake, they think, of calling these guys on his home phone instead of using a payphone. Uh. So Robert Blake is ultimately charged with murder and two counts of solicitation of murder. Mm -hmm. They go to trial. By the time the trial happens, he is completely gray. The jury really felt sorry for him. That was the big takeaway I got. He looked very old and feeble. They really, really called out Bakley, the wife's character, and how this was her 10th husband and she'd done this before and she was a little bit of a gold digger. And they felt sorry for that. This, This was shocking to me. It is, but it isn't. They felt bad for the fact that his defense attorney kind of wasn't doing anything. Uh, They were like, he looked like he was just sitting there. He didn't seem to be making much of a fight, which, as the defendant, you don't have to do anything. We should make that clear. You have no obligation. It's the state's burden. Yeah, true. But the thing that ultimately led to Robert Blake's acquittal was that when they called these two dudes, these two stuntmen up to the stand, they destroyed their credibility. Mm -hmm. They both had a history of drug problems. One of them was currently charged with something. And by him testifying, it was understood that he was going to get a better deal. And it was an unrelated thing. It was like a theft or something. Right. And then this was the worst part to me. One of them had had problems with his mental health to the point that he was very paranoid. Like he was under the impression there were 20 spies following him at that moment, which to me was just like, well, now we're done. Yeah. Like, why did the prosecution think that they'd get anywhere with that? My question is, why on earth didn't you talk to them before? Right. Did you not talk to them before? Did you, I know what probably they talked to him one time and then saw on the day of and was like, okay, so we're just going to go over everything we did before. Right. But that seems... I don't know. I would rather I would rather speak to them again and make sure I got all everything straightened. Yeah. Ultimately, he's found not guilty of the murder, not guilty of one count of solicitation. And then the jury was deadlocked 11 to 1, leaning towards not guilty on the second solicitation. And the judge ultimately dismissed it. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there was a civil case where Bakley's children sued Robert Blake for wrongful death, and they did, he was found liable. And uh, he was ordered to pay $30 million, and he ultimately never did. On February 3rd of 2006, he filed, had to file for bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And he's had a relatively low profile since. Uh, He's always maintained his innocence. Yeah, I read a little bit about him and Bakley's daughter. So what ultimately happened to her, she was 11 months old, like when this all, when her mom was murdered. And Blake's daughter from his first marriage, because I think his first marriage was from like the 60s and now it's like the 2000s. Um, Oh God. Yeah. So his daughter from the first marriage actually adopts this child. And so she was raised with like Blake's other daughter being her mom and her husband being her dad. And so she just recently like did an interview with Good Morning America where she said that she has spoken to Robert Blake, but she didn't want to ask anything about her mother's murder. She said that she's like really not ready for any of that. And they just talked about like baby pictures and what she was like as a baby and what life was like for him growing up because she's still, well, she was 19 then. I guess she's probably like 21 now. So just very complicated life dynamics there. But I mean, at least it sounds like Blake's other daughter provided her with a good life. So that's like a weird happy ending versus being raised by this old man who's going through bankruptcy and may or may have not killed your mom. Yeah. That's nice. (laughs) I want to say it's, I want to say it's a little weird that it's like your sister, but it's your mom, but I guess that's not that weird. It's not like a, I don't know. It's not like an incest thing or something like that. That's what's going on in my head anyway. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's not that. So that is the story with Robert Blake. Yes. Now, let's get into this guy that Dick and Perry were on death row with. Yeah. And they were on death row with five people in Kansas. But the one that I think that was the most interesting, the most famous, and is featured in the movie is a guy named Lowell Lee Andrews. And he goes by Andy. And he goes by Andy in the movie. You notice in the movie, towards the end, Dick looks up and is yelling at a guy. And it's a weird, it's crazy because of how, his demeanor is so different from what he did. Mm-hmm. He's a chubby little, like, guy with with glasses and he's reading and you can tell he's a little socially awkward when he's talking to dick and that's how this guy really was and dick makes the comment that this kid in the town he grew up in was quote the nicest boy in wolcott which was the town Mm -hmm. and that was what he was known as and it was a shock when he was sentenced to death so who this guy was loli andrews he was born on september 21st of 1940 he Grew up in Wolcott, Kansas, went to the University of Kansas. He was a sophomore and he was a very awkward kid. Mm-hmm. He ends up coming home for the Thanksgiving holiday, and he was 18 years old at the time. And what his family did not realize is he had a mom, dad, and a sister. Mm-hmm was that he was having some severe psychological issues. I mean, that's what they were. They don't say that at the time. Yeah. He was fantasizing about poisoning his family and then moving to Chicago. He had this dream of becoming a gangster and a professional hitman. Mm -hmm. He comes home in 1958, and he was in his room, like, fantasizing about all these things. He would stay in his room all day. His parents and his sister are out in the living room, and he comes, he gets a gun, a twenty-two caliber rifle, And he also had a revolver, comes downstairs, and they look at him, and they ask, like, they just look at him like, hey, what's up? And he just starts shooting at them. Mm. And he ultimately would shoot his father 17 times. His mother tried to run away, and she shot her down and then continued to shoot her. Mm. After he did this, he sat in the house for a little bit. He ate a snack, and then he went and walked off and went to this theater nearby his house and watched a movie to kind of give himself an alibi. Uh. He saw Mardi Gras, which was made in 1958. Fun fact. (laughs) He ended up dismantling both of these guns and throwing them into the Kansas River. And then he came back and called the police and said that he wanted to report a robbery, that someone had robbed him and that his parents were killed. And when the police get there, they immediately notice something is wrong because he's so unconcerned about his family, his entire family being dead. And what they did was they called a reverend from, or a, I guess it was a preacher from like the local church. It was a Baptist church. And they knew that this guy knew him. Mm-hmm. And they said, something's not right. Can you please talk to him? With Like, he's not acting right. Right. So he's talking to this priest or this preacher. And he ultimately ends up admitting that he committed these murders. And he does it in a way that's so casual. He's like, well, I think I messed up. And then he said, I'm not sorry that I did it. I don't know why I did it. I just didn't even feel anything when they died. Hmm. And so he is ultimately... 
tried and he is also convicted and sentenced to death. And he was another case that was looked at by Dr. Satan, John Satan, the guy that did that study about murder without motive. That was his actual name? It's S-A-T-T-E-N. So I don't know if I'm pronouncing it wrong. I realized the second I said it, I was like, that's probably I mean, I don't know. Satin? I'll take it. He he was another person that, in addition to Perry Smith, that he examined saying, I think he falls into this category of persons where... They're not insane all the time, but they they have mental illness that causes them to commit these murders without any motive. Right. And his lawyers actually were trying to get the Kansas courts to alter their precedent. And we don't talk about this a lot, but basically common law follows that you're going to follow what happened before. You're not going to change that. So Kansas is obviously going to keep following this McNaughton rule for insanity. And they were trying to get them to change that to go by the Durham rule, which is a little bit different, Mm -hmm. which would have possibly made it to where they could have pled not guilty by insanity. They try this with this Andy guy's case. It ultimately doesn't work. And when he was in prison, he was... Uh, always very bookish. He got along okay with Dick, just like they show in the movie, but Perry hated this guy. Huh. And the reason he hated him was Perry was very weird. You can really see the mental health aspect of it too in this, but Perry got very insecure about the fact that he wanted to be very smart. He wanted to seem very intellectual to other people, but this kid actually was. He was actually very smart. Right. And it made him so insecure that being around this guy was one of the reasons that drove Perry into this very weird hunger strike that he did while he was on death row. And I mentioned that on an Instagram post. Perry Smith did have a, I believe it was six month hunger strike that he did. And he said overall it was because he wanted to be in charge of when he died. He didn't want other people controlling that. Mm Mm-hmm. But the way it started was this Andy guy said something to him, corrected him and how he spoke. And it, this is how it's explained in the book. He got so upset he stopped eating. Wow. And it just evolved into this whole mess of him not eating for six months. Wow. Ultimately, Andy was executed. And that is the story of Lowly Andrews. So I really liked that one. And I liked that they had him in the movie because I think they portrayed him really well. Yeah. Last thing is the possibility that Dick and Perry committed another murder while they were on the run. Mm -hmm. I talked about this when we were in the main episode that they drove around the country. Once they came back in from Mexico, they drove around just trying to get work a ton. Right. And in the book, it portrays it as this. They're in Miami. And that was one of the big things they wanted to do. They wanted to be in Miami for Christmas. They're on the beach. And Dick is reading the newspaper. And it's commenting how this family in Offspree, Florida, was murdered, like brutally murdered around the time that they were coming into Florida. Hmm. And it makes it seem like Perry is completely ignorant of anything that might have happened. Right. He looks over at Dick and he's like, I know we were driving from some other state into Tallahassee at that time. And he's asking him, where were we exactly? Like, is it possible that he would have snuck off and committed this murder? Because the thing is, is the murder was very similar to the clutters. They were shot with a twenty-two. It was a mother and a father and their two kids. Mm -hmm. And I should say their names. I'm sorry. It's Christine and Cliff Walker and their two children. Christine was home and... And these people, they believe what happened was they tried to make it seem like they were car salesmen because that that's the theory if it was to compare how they did this. They went to them saying that they were interested they're interested in selling their car to him because they wanted to steal the car. Mm-hmm. They come into the house and they shoot her. Then the Cliff comes home with his two kids and they shoot him and ultimately kill the children. And I believe it was Christine at some point was sexually assaulted because there was DNA found. Mm. The physical evidence was this DNA and then a bloody cowboy boot, a cellophane strip from a cigarette and a fingerprint on the bathroom faucet. And later in the 60s, they suspected it might be Dick and Perry, but not at first. The book makes it seem like they never at any point were separated at a time where they could have committed this. It kind of gives them an alibi that they were driving. Right. Actual facts are more up for debate. At one point, there was a serial killer named Emmett Monroe Spencer that tried to say that he committed the murder, but later psychologists said that it wasn't First of all, it wasn't possible for for him to have been there at that time. And then they said he's a pathological liar. He didn't do this. Got it. Then later in 1994, this is so random, a bartender in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, contacted the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office saying that one of her customers was boasting about killing the Walker family. Wow. I would never, I I don't know. Would you call the police on that? (laughs) 
I don't know if I would think it was real. I mean, I guess it would depend on how much the person was saying and if they gave me a super creepy vibe, maybe. Yeah. Because at this point, it would be like an old man telling her details at the bar. Could be pretty creepy. Yeah, that would be weird. I feel like I would just be freaked out and not want (laughs) to think about it ever again. I'd be like, this guy's just nuts. But... Perry Smith and Dick Hickok ultimately come in more officially in 2012. What happens is they say that they're really going to seriously look at them. And in December, they actually said that they were going to exhume Dick and Perry's bodies because they were going to try to take mitochondrial DNA from their bones Mm. to compare to the DNA that was found in the house. Okay. And so they take that DNA and they test it. And like I mentioned earlier, they were killed with the same weapon. They were in that area area around the same time Mm -hmm. on that same night that they were murdered they were actually seen in a store and the clerk said that they had scratches all over their face like they had been in a fight and they had just checked out of the miami hotel shortly before this murder occurred so they were not they were not like in a hotel they didn't have a place to stay at that moment right Ultimately, when the DNA is tested, it is too degraded to be able to fully rule them in or rule them out. Mm -hmm. So as of 2021, the case is still unsolved, but Dick and Perry are still considered persons of interest in it. However, there is a woman from the University of Pennsylvania named Catherine Ramsland, and she believes that it's unlikely it was them only because of some of the things that were taken, they think that the killer was probably someone they knew. Uh, One random thing was their marriage license was taken from the house that night. They couldn't find it. And then later it showed up in boxes stored by one of their nieces. Oh, yeah, that is weird. Yeah. So that was one thing. But I mean, it's the first thing you come in, someone's killed. And the first thing you do is like, where's their marriage license? Why were they looking for that? How did they notice that? Is it possible it got lost before? Yeah, that's true. And then they never ruled out that guy who admitted it in the bar or like they didn't have enough to talk to him they never sought it out they just basically took this lady's story and then were like okay thanks <laughs> and they don't give a name either like she might have said a name to the police mm-hmm. but there's not a name in anything i found now granted yeah. my research in this is not as much as when I, we do the main episodes right, so right, right. yeah but it's still open right now it is still open they still do not know, know who killed this family but it's possible that dick and perry did commit this so that's my last fact i think we're we've been on for a while but what do you got any closing stuff no i think that's it that's was a fun one i know it was a a long one but it was worth it i am sorry i dropped for all those who were on the live and saw me drop my phone that's for you i'm gonna edit that out of the mini so that will go on the podcast feed we will always take our lives and record them and then we will put them on the podcast feed as mini so so you can listen to them later if you want to but thank you so much guys our next one is molly's game i'm working on that right now it is gonna come out not this coming monday but the next and then we will keep going from there and like i said we're gonna be doing a hiatus and then go into season two so that we're more consistent with bringing things out also so i'm not like up at all hours like frantically trying to finish stuff all right Thank you so much, guys. We'll see y'all later. Bye. Bye.